Hello and welcome to the Point to Rise show. This is your host, Suzanne Prochel, former international ballerina that found her passion in mindset, business, and technology, and is today the founder of Rise Media. It is my purpose to use all the experiences of my past to create a better, financially sustainable future for the performing arts industry. And that starts with every single one of us. I believe that being you is your superpower. And I am here to guide you, empower you, inspire you, and give you all the resources you need to rise above what you think you're capable of. Every week, I'll bring you free shows featuring guests, collaboration, and many episodes to ensure that you have the support in your journey as a performer. I want you to know that you are not alone. Stop chasing and start creating. Your success starts now here with you. So let's go. Hello, hello, and we are back. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's guest is... Christine, and I hope I'm saying this right because, you know, I'm German and sometimes we just don't get the Kristen, Christine, Kirsten, Christine Koskin. She is a former dancer and a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in performance nutrition. She owns a private practice. She offers nutrition counseling to dancers around North America to help them maximize performance, improve recovery, and maintain body composition without dieting or disordered eating. She works with dancers who struggle with eating disorders, are recovering from injuries, and those with connective tissue disorders. Her work has been recognized internationally and includes presentations at the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science. She's a founding member of Dance Medica, and the resident dietitian for Bendy Bodies. Christine is a consultant dietitian to ballet companies across the country and popular guest lecturer to university dance programs. She's a frequent contributor to media, including Dance Magazine, Point Magazine, Dance Spirit, Dance Teacher, Oprah, Cooking Light, Martha Stewart, Shape, NBC News, and Today, and often interviewed by industry podcasts like Dance Well, Beyond the Point, and Bendy Bodies to share her insight to dancer health and performance. <sighs> the more I'm diving into who, what beautiful, beautiful soul Christine is, the more I'm thrilled to share her here on this platform with you. So if you want to dive a little bit deeper into how important nutrition are for dancers, Tune in, keep on listening, grab a cup of coffee. This conversation has the potential to change your life. So without no further ado, here we go. Welcome to the show, Christine. I am so grateful that you're here. As I said before, I've been waiting for this conversation for a while. So the more am I grateful that you could make the time available. Oh, I, it is my pleasure. It is absolutely my pleasure, Suzanne. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Okay. So since I already prefaced this podcast with, you know, your accomplishments and what you have done, I want to dig a little bit deeper in what gets you up in the morning. How did you get to being like a nutritionist? What's the path and who, who are you? So let's yeah. start there. So how did you get yeah. to becoming a, a nutritionist? And then maybe you can tie that in on, on how, what gets you up in the morning? Yeah, you know, those and those two things are definitely interrelated. So growing up, I danced from the time I was very young. And by the time I was 11 or 12, I was in a pre-professional program. And so, you know, that that's when the flip switched for me that it was all about ballet and I was all in. And I was lucky enough that my director actually had some, a few insights about nutrition. Like she would give us a few recommendations and actually the recommendations she gave were pretty good. And, and so for that, I was very grateful, including, you know, so like before performance things. And I thought, Ooh, if you're supposed to do this before a performance, like if, it, if this is helpful to eat these things, this amount of time before performing, there's got to be more to this. And so that really got the wheels turning in the background. Now, 
also going on is concurrently, I was fully immersed in the world of ballet. And that has really not there, we're, we're making some strides in terms of body image, diet, disordered eating, all those kinds of things, but we're really not there yet. And so much of it is still, I mean, it's, it's like it was in the eighties and it, what it was like in the eighties is, you know, we can roll it back. I don't know what the sixties. And I think that's about the right timeline. And yeah. And so the culture of dance and thin and all those things really made an impact on me. I ended up going to college where I was on the cheer staff, another, I retired from ballet. I, I, I didn't feel like there was a career for me there because I didn't think I had the body. Like that was my limiting factor was I don't have the body for this. And I also knew that it, I, I was concerned about the, I don't know, the overall environment of, and that it, would I thrive in that or would it just feel dark to me? And so anyway, so I went off to college and decided I'd answer some of these other questions. And found myself in the middle of a raging eating disorder. I was on the church staff at my university, which at the time, that also meant basically I was, that was the college dance component. So a lot of what you see with competitive cheer and dance and stuff, a lot of those dance things that was there. So, you know, short skirts and all that kind of stuff was still part of my life. So I was doing that. And, um, and I really found that I needed to have a lot of answers. You know, how does your body work? How do we, how do we do these things? And the fact that the issues that may have started and may not have even been triggered by things people think they may be triggered by, like someone making a comment about your body, may not be the only things that lead to mental health issues, disordered eating, eating disorders, all kinds of things that we see come up. And so I, I found that I was, so I had, so I ended up with this eating disorder and my friends basically staged a bit of an intervention and contacted my parents. And I went to see a dietitian and it did not go well. They, it, it was just like, it was horrible. It was really horrible. And I thought, this is the best you can do. I was like, I'm going to have to figure it out by myself. And so really that, that became, that was the why. And so everything after that was, how do I, how do I figure this out for myself? And when I did, it was like, I don't ever want anyone else to go through these things. And so, you know, my why is everyone in, you know, all these, in my mind, you know, those, those people who I relate with, I don't, I don't want them to have problems with eating or nutrition or fueling themselves while they're dancing or after they stop, because the people who retire, quit, whatever, tend to be, they're, they're forgotten when they're not right there in front of us, yet they still can have so many of these issues. So that, that is my why every day to be who I needed when I was younger. And again, I, I had a pretty good, ex I, I had a decent experience. Mine wasn't, you know, mine wasn't the horrible set of, of circumstances that we hear, hear so many dancers go through. You know, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I think we're like there is no scale here, you know, your, yours was worse than mine or yours was better mm -hmm. than mine. I think the fact that we, we are encountering that and still encountering in whatever scale, like an eating disorder doesn't mean you cannot retain food necessarily. There are many different stages around eating disorders or, and I am not an expert. This is why you are here. We're going to talk about that. I still struggle with relationship to food. Like I don't have a dancer body anymore. Neither do I need to. I'm turning into a woman. However, my sub now at 48, I'm finally turning into a woman. I'm yeah. starting to be okay with having features like a woman. And I struggle because I have been taught for many, many decades that you can't, you shouldn't. Take, don't, don't have breasts, don't have muscles. And I, I think we underestimate the impact that has been given during this time, you know, professional or not, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you're in a studio and you're being taught these things, that will, that trickles in everything and anything that you will do professional or not. Yes. Oh, you, you have brought up so many points there. I'm going to start with the comparison game and you nailed it. We, the compare, there is no compare, there is no winner for being the worst. There is no, you do, and, and if you struggle with disordered eatings, your relationship with food and eating disorder, you don't have to be bad enough or sick enough. 
if you suspect you have a problem, you do. And that's the time to get help. So it's not, oh, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. So therefore I, you know, I don't need help. No, get the help now. The sooner that we have intervention, the better your recovery will be. And the sooner you can be free of these shackles that absolutely damage and destroy lives. And they impact them. Like you said, you're 48 years old and these things still impact you. And it doesn't have to be anyone saying something directly to you, like you need to lose weight, get on the scale, like these very pointed things. It can be subtle things like what are the, what are the images being portrayed at the studio? Are they all, are they the picture of an emaciated dancer where you see every striation in her back? And we are a community who, you know, find great beauty in that. Is it because the beauty of they are so damn thin yet still can perform and dance? Like they're walk there is, is the beauty in walking the line between dance and death? Is that what we see the beauty in? Or is it we expect that because that form, they have that form, that they therefore must have be able to function at a very high level, you know? And initially, a lot of these things, the idea is form follows function. You know, dancers, they, they work so hard and to do these things, they, you know, their bodies do, they're just thin because they, you know, that's just how ballet makes you if you do all these things and, and follow the the protocols that give you long lines and lean muscles or whatever. And that's really not the way it works. And so looking at form as the, an aesthetic or form as the result of how you actually train are different things. They're really different things. And so, yes, what a studio looks like can have a huge impact. Is there, are there dancers who are praised for being thin? I've seen this happen. Someone comes back, they're sicker, you know, they're sick to the point of maybe even hospitalization and they come back and they're weak and they and they they've lost a lot of just strength because they're still recovering and they're praised because of the weight loss not because of their performance and that message is received by everyone in that room and it like and like throwing a stone in the pond the ripples will go out and it'll go outside that room too everyone gets the message and it goes the other way too right being in front of everybody reckoned for Hmm. not in a good way for gaining weight. Uh, I remember over and over and over again, like the weekly weigh-in we had and the next morning there would be the replication of like, why did you gain 500 grams? You didn't grow. This can't go on. You have to lose weight. You see, because you weren't disciplined enough, now you're jumping like an elephant. I can't even... I can't even look at you anymore. And, and mm -hmm. we're using these harsh, diminishing, shaming words around our ability on, on growing, developing bodies and not understanding what kind of a damage that can actually permanently do to everybody involved. And we're not talking only women. Like I, I have been in a, in a system where we had boys being so sick mm -hmm. as they had, they thought that's how they are going to be seen if they're really skinny, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. W women are not, this is, this is not limited to gender, age, race, creed, sex, none of it. It is all, everyone is a fair game when it comes to eating disorders and they can go either way, whether it's, you know, one of the indicators and weight may not even be, you know, weight is a sign, but only 6% of people with eating disorders actually are medically, what we would consider medically underweight. So there are so many people that have eating disorders or disordered, disordered eating, and you don't know, and they can put on a beautiful face and they can do all these things, but on the inside, they're dying, you know, whether metaphorically or physically, they're dying and it can go under the radar just because they may not present in the expected way that someone with an eating disorder, you know, we think that they do. So what would, could you like open up a little bit around examples and what to look for, like even in ourselves, maybe we, you know, we don't have that support system like you did, you have to support yourself, like what are signs and besides you, where can people go? Like, what are the first steps to 
understanding that I may have a problem. Sure. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting because I think the, the, with regard to healthcare, the professionals who are going to be most dialed into this and be keep have this filter on most consistently are going to be mental health professionals and dietitians because we see this stuff and particularly people who work with dancers are we going to assume everyone has an eating disorder no but we may be able to pick up on subtleties that suggest there's something going on and also may have questions that help to 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 discover these things you know that other that other people aren't going to have and other professions might make wrong assumptions like oh if you have a low resting heart rate you must be a well-trained athlete and well-trained athletes often do have a low resting heart rate but when they get up and walk across the room that heart rate stays low whereas someone who's malnourished and may have a low resting heart rate but when they get up and walk across the room their heart their heart rate goes very very fast to try and keep up because the muscle may not be in the condition that it needs to be it's really not their muscle isn't slow because they're well conditioned it's because it's trying to conserve energy so those are some things that we we look at and we want to make sure aren't misinterpreted that's one one thing if to, for a person to say you know something to look at is shame with food how do you feel when you eat is it a feeling of uh, that word shame do you feel shame personally disgusted it, do you do do you feel afraid of food eating in general eating specifically you know like specific foods are there foods that you're afraid of are there safe foods where you'll only eat certain foods oftentimes people with eating disorders have patterns and rituals around food so they if you notice that you can only eat certain food combinations or you be, start to feel a level of anxiety, that could be something. If certain food groups like carbohydrates or fat are fear foods to you, then that could be an indicator that something, that, that your relationship with food isn't healthy. If you're looking, if you avoid social situations where you know food's gonna be there because you can't control the food, that's an indicator. If you notice that you isolate yourself or only eat by yourself, that's an indicator. If you eat in secret because you don't want other people to see you, it doesn't have to be binging, but even if it's, I don't want people to see me eat this food for any reason, that can be an indicator. There are lots of things, you know, people will think, oh, if I see, if you, you know, some people have swelling here because they've done purging or marks on their knuckles, weight changes up or down can be indicators, but not necessarily. They can be indicators of all kinds of other things going on, including normal growth and development um, to gain weight. Right? We, we want to see that. Yeah. Weight wow. is such a flexible, you know, it is, it, it's a parameter that shouldn't be a one-off. We want to look at all kinds of things. When you're looking at weight, it's not something we look at by itself. We need to look at all kinds of things surrounding it because weight gain can be too where you are in your menstrual cycle, assuming you're having one. Men don't and children don't, but women and girls, if you're not having one by the age of 16, something's wrong. You need to check that out. And just because if someone tells you it's normal, it's not. It may be common in certain places, but it doesn't mean that it's normal. And we need to make sure that we keep those terms clear. Oh, I so... Mm that I really want to point out, common does not mean normal or healthy, right? Yeah. And I think oh. specifically when it comes to nutrition for dancers, we have established so many common things that are not healthy. And we're, we're just starting to scratch the surface on breaking these the, the, the difference between common and normal apart. And also, I feel like it's almost like generational trauma that is being released because it has been in the belief system from generation to generation, right? We put teachers that have had perhaps some eating disorders into the studios with new with the new generation of dancers and they just perpetually promote their beliefs and their thinking and their measures onto this new generation. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why we're still talking about this. I am not saying that teachers need to know everything about Done. nutrition. What I'm saying is that they need to know to connect their students, students. with 
somebody that is an expert in that field so that they can give them the very best and set them up for success. Absolutely right. You know, this idea we ballet and I mean, well, specifically ballet is the dance culture, but ballet in particular, we, there's a lot of, there's history and tradition are very important and we can still, and history and tradition can be important. We also need to make sure that when we, when new information and science comes into play, that we actually recognize, observe, and follow the science. So for example, we know different things about turnout or in dance pedagogy. There's an entire world dedicated to the language you use for teaching. The, the phrase, I can see your lunch is lazy teaching. What does that mean? I mean, first of all, it sends a really bad message to the student, but what they need to know how to engage, what, what should they be engaging or not engaging to stand the way they need to stand. And if they did just have their lunch, yeah, they may be distended a little bit because food takes up space and that's okay. And we need to not make that part of the shaming thing and inadvertently associate eating with not being a, a valid dancer or, you know, that, that it diminishes you somehow because it does not. Having, I recommend to, you know, every person at the front of the room, teachers, directors, studio owners, whatever, to have a list of trusted resources that they can refer their dancers to. And even better, if they can help those their students make those connections early on and normalize having dance medicine professionals in your life, that's great. So right off the bat, physical therapy, athletic trainers, mental health professionals, dietitians are all people that you can bring into the studio. Now with Zoom, it's easier than ever. And, you know, have an overview of, hey, this is what nutrition for dancers looks like, or do assessments, have a PT come in and do pre-assessments so that their dancers may pick up, you have this weakness here. If you start working on this weakness now, you can do it as prehab and do the same exercises and avoid an injury, or <laughs> you cannot do this stuff, suffer the injury, have to sit out, lose time, in, you know, lose time performing and still do perhaps these similar sorts of exercises. So bringing those people in can be very helpful. And, and really, again, I'm, I'm said this, but I want to emphasize the idea of normalizing getting help. St dance teachers and studio owners and directors, they have a lot to do. Their job is to instruct and to keep up with new, new innovations and in, in teaching technique and not just leaning on, I was taught this. We know more. There's a you know, there's a world committed to learning and teaching how to do things better. That's, that's a lot to keep up with. And, and, you know, if you have to manage a staff or a budget or do choreography or costuming or any of those kinds of things, run a business, you've got all that to do. These other things are medical professions and people have gone to school for multiple years. They have done internships and taken all the tests and passed the board and are licensed in those singular fields. They're not, they're not interests. They're not passions. They are, they're dedicated healthcare fields. And so you don't have to be, you're not expected to be one of those because your job is to do something else. Making the connections can be a wonderful gift to your students. Exactly. And, and I think that brings out the question, you know, why are you there? Like, what's your objective? Are you here for your students or is it your ego that's in the way of preventing you from actually connecting and making sure that this next generation is looked after and when that means? And if that means it's different from what you've been brought up to, yes, thank you. Thank you for giving me the gift to be that bridge. Thank you for being me for making me the implementer versus I can't believe I didn't get that. And if I didn't get that, then this generation is also not going to get it. It's like, it's not about us anymore. Like we had our time on stage. We're now in a position where we can help and apply the knowledge that we have gained and question that knowledge too. Does it still apply in today's market? You said something so beautifully, the history and tradition of Bali. Okay, let's, let's go there. Louis XIV, he came up with, he was a great dancer himself. He came up with, you know, the, the core, the ballet. Everybody had to be the same. And we are still 
in that belief system. What was it like 15th century, 14th century, yeah. 16th, somewhere in there? Yeah. We're in the 21st century. Like there is no reason why we still have to carry this tradition on. It is in our hands to change that. We're not a sellout because we're not applying all of the traditions. The art form itself, all of the art forms are evolving and that should include ballet and dance and being open to that without having the fear that we're going to lose something. Like everybody's looking at, oh, we're going to lose all of this. And we're not looking at what, what could we potentially gain, right? Yeah. And that goes into how and what we're expecting our dancers to do, how we expect them to do it, not giving them any tools, not even being curious about what is out there nowadays. How can we support? I don't know where to, I know where to go from here, but if, you, if there's something that came in for you, please go share. Yeah. Well, I think there are several things. I think one, the first thing that comes to mind is that we're all wrong sometimes. All of us, we make people make mistakes. They, and, and if we come with the understanding that most people are doing the best they can with what they have, we're all doing that. It's also our responsibility to do better. And that, which is what you said, we, it is our responsibility to do better and to seek out what that is. So there aren't, with, in the world we live in now, there really aren't excuses to not be doing better. We have so many resources, qualified resources available to guide us. It's not that you have to, you know, use Dr. Google to fix your, you know, your stuff. It's there are qualified professionals who can help you. If you have been doing things, and a lot of people do things with really good intentions. So I hear um, teachers tell me, well, in my studio, you know, dancers aren't allowed to bring in junk food or I throw away their lunch if it is full of crap or they can't have sugary drinks or we didn't drink water when I was dancing and it really builds up to your stamina and I don't want my kids to be soft so we don't do that. They can all be really well-intended or they'll use things like, oh, the, the recommendations from the government say you shouldn't have more than this much, name your ingredient, name your nutrient. And so, and, and so they'll repeat these things to their students, not knowing that it's misapplied. So that's not good information for them. They aren't the general population. That's bad information. And when we, you know, or when we talk about foods being good or bad, that can carry a lot of weight and you don't, and that's a, that's its own conversation. Like we could go for a couple hours on that, but that's not your job your job, it's not to, that your job is to instruct ballet. If you don't want sticky drinks on the Marley, because you don't want sticky drinks on, because of the Marley and it's your Marley, that's up to you. But it, but you may be compromising your dancers if, if they actually do better from having a sports drink, depending on the situation. And that is something that could be sticky and you're undermining it because it's a sports drink, drink and you're just not aware of how that's benefiting them then that can be a problem. So this is where we want to really make sure that nutrition information isn't giving out um, haphazardly or based on common sense or generalities or anything like that, because it's very nuanced. Slight comments can make a very big difference. What one kid sees happen to another kid or overhears can be a big deal. And the studio isn't a place to work out our issues right? So if you heard something and, and I think that that sometimes happens just in what I've seen and in what I hear from dancers I work with, sometimes that happens and we don't want to do that. So it's okay to feel embarrassed to yourself. Like, oh, I feel embarrassed that I've done this, or I feel badly that, oh gosh, I perpetuated stuff. That's okay. That's a good, that's a good starting place for change. And we've all made mistakes where we look back and said, wow, I wish I wouldn't, <laughs> now that I know better, I wouldn't have recommended that, said that, or anything. Two things that came up for me, I, I, it's the good or bad, right? We're making it an all or nothing. You're either good or you're bad. Be the good girl. If you do this, you're the bad girl. And I'm, I'm taking girl as an example because yeah. I personally can relate to that. That's how mm -hmm. I was brought up. And we're making it such a, there's nothing in between. There's no 
no ground for negotiation or learning or anything, right? And, and just by simply changing the language that we're using as in, hey, that was helpful, that was useful, and this didn't serve me, we're, we're not putting an absolute, an end, and not enough or enough in, into the conversation, which, which for me personally feels much more like easier. That makes me, I don't feel like I'm suffocating or yeah. I don't have a way out, right? I'm, I'm not keep seeking the validation of, yes, you are the good girl because you did this. This was enough for me. And another thing that came up for me when you were talking is that understanding where we're at is so important to, to really strategize and how we can get better and going somewhere. Like the shame that perhaps many carry when they first, you know, learn that they have done things wrong. It's like, oh my gosh, congratulations. You actually are courageous enough to look at yourself, still love you and say, hey, that, that's definitely what I taught and I'm changing it right now, today. Because that is the biggest gift you can give everybody. Being ashamed around it and, and hiding and then keep going with that is the worst that you can do. Oh, totally. And, and just to add one thing to that, your change does not undermine or negate those teachers, directors you had who you love and respected. They are still worthy of that love and respect. They were, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to assume that they were doing the best they had with what they had. And that's how it went. And if people aren't doing their best and they really are just mean, nasty people, there are some of those out there too. And if you have those in your life, get out of that studio. Like, let's not, I, because to be clear, there are those out there and we don't, and don't sugarcoat things. And if you or your child are someplace that is not um, safe for them mentally or emotionally, get the hell out. Yes. Okay. Question. So yeah. I had a conversation um, a few weeks back where the question was framed this way. Do you think that if we are actually putting all of these mindset tools and nutrition tools and, and, and into the mix of forming dancers, artists, isn't that going to make them weak and less off because we're giving them all of these different tools. They're going to forget how to work hard. And it triggered me deeply. Like I had to really control myself not to go back to my, my, my animal instinct and just to react I had to recognize that I was triggered personally and, and just breathe and not answer the question right away. So how do you feel about that? I think that those are control mechanisms and they, dancers want to dance. And frankly, if we eliminated a lot of that stuff, we might actually have more people involved in dance. These, so much of this stuff is, it benefits directors in front of the room. Dancers aren't going to be weaker. They want to be there. If I, and this is a, this is the mindset shift, and it really come it comes from the top and the front, right? It's not the dancers who need the shift. They're doing just fine, and it really comes to why are we doing this? And frankly, it's oftentimes because it makes them easier to control. Dance is a dancers are taught to be. They, it's an art form without words, so they automatically don't have a voice. <laughs> just in their art. I mean, there are a few times where, you know, maybe musical theater and, and there are a few times there may be a piece where words come out, but on the whole, they don't. And so anytime we say we want to expand the humanity of the dancer, what that does is allows them to have a life, not be damaged. You know, it's, it's for me, so much of what I see is those are the things that circle into how close to death in ballet, can you walk and, and, and not fall over the edge? And the people who get the closest, they, they are deemed the winners. They, they may often have an emaciated appearance in ballet that, that is going to win like that. You know, we know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
that in most that emaciated appearance that in most cultures and most situations we would look at as someone and saying so to, someone's very ill like there is something wrong in in the medical field wow if you've lost something something's wrong that's not okay we we applaud it in the dance world we applaud bleeding through your shoes we applaud all these things that are just wreckage and i think i think when we've spoken earlier i said you know it's the dying swan that's the mascot of ballet um and so if we remove this, like, what do we think everyone's just going to go rogue and what and really like, what, what do you think's going to happen? <laughs> what are you so afraid of if they had, to, if they had two days off so that one day they could do their laundry and their work and, you know, their household chores and one day to actually rest and pursue something outside the studio? Like, do you think they're going to, what's, what's going to happen besides the fact that they may have reduced injuries, improved mental health, improved relationships? longer careers, more people may be available to be involved because, you know, they can tolerate that? Okay, <clears throat> two things. So I heard you say it's on, on the teachers to change that or the, like the industry itself to, to change like the mindset or in the teaching and, and them who they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I, and I know we've talked about this before. I think it is also imperative that the dancers themselves, the artists venture out more, meaning that they adapt a business mindset, meaning that they know how they can help themselves when the people that they expect help from are denying them that core need. Oh, yeah. oh, I was talking about this just yesterday. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So for example, I saw something where I think this was in dance edit that I read it, that a dancer stood up because dancers for the Super Bowl, the most highly viewed sporting event in the United States, an event where massive amounts of money are spent and paid, dancers were supposed to volunteer. And yeah, and this happens, and this is something, so these are things we see, and I think it starts at, check the dance edit for that, fact check it for me, okay, <laughs> right there. I see this all the time. It's like, oh, show up, this is gonna, you're gonna get, and this starts at a young age, and this is where the other, pe the people who need to be the support staff here are parents. I mentioned earlier, if your kid's in a bad place, get them out. The idea, if parents would band together effectively form a union. And this is going to be hard because a lot of times they want, no one wants to rock the boat. Everyone wants their kid to be happy. Everyone wants their kid to be elevated, their child to be Clara, you know, all the things. But in reality, if parents would stand up and put a kibosh to a lot of these things, that's where it would start because the parent, where does, where do, where do these people get their money? Studios get it from parents. Eventually, I mean, there's some professionals who are paying things and companies get it from patrons, right? I mean, that's a, where a lot of our funding comes. So if you start and then, and here's the other thing, and then a lot of the patrons are those kids who are in the dance studios earlier, or maybe the parents. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's not a very broad base for, there aren't very many income streams for this, if we're looking at a business model. So yeah. So the idea is starting with you, you don't just go do work for free for your studio. You're not going to do work for, if your studio wants to do a promo and have the dancers go, that confuses me because what you've just taught those kids is you go do things for free to promote you. You're going to benefit from it. What? Oh, they're going to get experience? What? Yeah, they're going to get experience in working for free and devaluing themselves, their craft and everything. They could, that's what they're getting. Oh, you're going to get exposure. What, to the elements if it's outside? What, oh, that's right. Oh, I'm sure that every time you're out there, there's always some sort of scout, some sort of college scholarship person hanging out there. No, that's not it. But, and the expectation is you're going to shut up, show up, and parents are going to pay up. They'll buy the costume for the event or whatever. So I think that's a distinct starting place. And the idea that just because someone is 18 and graduates from high school or they join a professional company at any age, that they're going to somehow now have these skills to say no or negotiate themselves or promote themselves or treat themselves as a business, that doesn't happen. Like there's nothing magical, but they're not going to come out of a BFA with that. They're not going to come out of their pre-professional training with that. 
This is something that needs to be learned just like any other business and treating your career as a business and your body as the tool <laughs> to said business and your brain is important. Oh, thank you for touching on that because it's, it is a full circle. So when we're denying ourselves or we're in an environment where we are reminded that we shouldn't be eating these things. We shouldn't be treating ourselves the way we deserve to be treated. That trickles down in every single element that we're experiencing in our life. You mentioned earlier, you know, the recognition for, you know, experiencing pain, working through injuries, being super skinny and getting recognition. If you look healthy, it really would like that. Mm not not okay not really for the part you're not the part your toes are bleeding that suffering is like the prerequisite that you need to meet in order to call yourself a dancer or an artist mm -hmm. and that may have been to Shakespeare's times or Vincent van Gogh <laughs> it's not now and it is not on us to carry these beliefs over to every generation. Like it is so in our hands to say no. And that is why dancers should not only know how to do a compre and an arabesque and know how to, to learn choreography. No, they need to learn on who they are, who they want to become, how not to be taken advantage of that working for free is not okay, no matter how much you love that. You know, when I learned that, when I started my first business, because I would give everything for free away mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I didn't know that I and what I have to offer carries a value, carries worth, that I have worth in this world. Mm -hmm. And when you are not valuing ourselves, then how can we give something away of value? And how can we see value in other people, in other products? This is the whole dilemma arts organizations have. They expect people to come. They expect people to give them money. Look at how the schools are set up. Schools mm -hmm. are raising money. Pardon me. You are a business, you're taking in money and the parents have to pay for the costumes and the performance and, and, and. I'm sorry. Maybe don't go to business school or to arts or get a, a degree in arts management because we're talking about the non-for-profit, you know, mindset there. Hire a business coach that is right now, here and now, building a business in 2022 and knows exactly where the world is at and take advice from them. Look at what they've built, six, seven, eight figures and, and know what you want and duplicate it. And it's possible in arts too. Like there are so many assets that are monetizable in schools too. And I don't understand that we have to really still lean on that. And I think, and this is a, a theory that if we would have a more abundant mindset of creating the financial stability, we would get out of this fear, lack-based mentality, not being good enough. And I think we would then be more open to reinvest into the product, into the, the kids that we're teaching and invest all of the knowledge that they could should have while growing into the best dancer that they could be. Yeah. And if we did these things, like looking at a business model, the, the patrons, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what the statistics are, but what if we broadened the audience? It's fairly narrow. What if we brought more people in elevated interest? You know, there are, that's not, I don't know how to do those things, but it seems like that would be, you know, get get the art to the people and not just wait for them to show up and you know pay and really and it is it's just like this it's it's the same people it's the same people who are the patrons they they were in the classes and you know were in the companies and now go back and bring their kids and and we look at and look at the dance world and the number of athletes there and then again there were dancers on the field phenomenal it was great I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl but you know it's I love watching the halftime show and look at the NFL and professional sports leagues 
they're, they're, they are athletes who entertain. They are not warriors. They're not heroes. They're athletes who provide an entertainment service. Kind of like dancers. Exactly like dancers. And, and our models are very different. Can we, let's just go there really quickly, because I, I think the, the, the whole reason why we see the need to starve ourselves, to, to not love ourselves, is because the, the entire industry is set up that way. The, you know, the starving artist, the, you know, again, the suffering for it, where sports, it's like, we're here to show you what we can do. Like, look at me, you mm -hmm. know, we're very primal and I'm the winner. He's the loser. We're going to hype each other up. We're working as a team. It doesn't need to be this complicated elite mindset, this, this, this complicated thinking in order to be eligible to, to be seen, loved and heard. Right. So so many people go and see the sports because they can relate to it because it's available because you can mm -hmm. watch it from your couch or you can go in the stadium, whatever mm -hmm. rocks your boat. You can have an app on your phone where you can like vote for your favorite, I was saying artist, but for your, you know, baseball player. Yeah. Player. Um, so they go where the people are. They have yeah. understood that community is what brings everybody together and keeps them alive. Oh, absolutely. And if you've ever been to Philadelphia is a phenomenal example of that. Their sports community is out of this world, you know, it is, and it really does. And they, and, and the athletes have actually done, in my opinion, uh, a lot to promote that. I was in Philadelphia several years ago and we went to a Phillies game and they had players working at the different ticket Things. So you could go see one of these, you know, your baseball, your, your favorite baseball player, Brian Howard, may be selling you your ticket at the first baseline ticket counter. Like they really do. And they interact and they're, they're part of that community team. You know, if we look at the way our school systems are, you will find baseball, football, basketball, you know, kind of the three big money earners, hockey, depending on where you live in in the schools, those are, those are accessible to a lot of people. And so people, they're familiar with them. They, you know, that is part of our American culture. It's open to change. It can be, it can be more than that. We don't have to limit it to that. I think when we, and again, if we go and look and, you know, look at other industries that are similar in terms of athletes and stuff, looking at the way universities and professional teams treat their players and what goes into supporting them and look at and contrasting that with the arts world is eye-opening. And so for example, if you are, if you are, my business associate just came in, Duke. If you are a, a division one athlete you, and you go to, you know, whatever school, they will have, you'll have access to a dietitian or nutritionist. They have dining halls that are specifically for the athletes, the NCAA considers it such a great advantage to have access to nutrition with food itself being considered, like how much food the athletes get, that's an advantage and access to the dietitian and those kinds of things that it's, it's monitored to make sure one school doesn't put too much money into it to give them more of an advantage over another, like there are regulations around it. In the dance world, we go the opposite way. It's if you, the only time you're going to see it, you know, quite frankly, the most often, there are some exceptions. There are definitely notable exceptions, but too often what it's been is if you're seeing a dietitian, it's because you have a problem, not you're proactive and I want to maximize my system. And this is what I see in my clients. Sometimes they come to me with a problem. Oftentimes they come with a problem, but what they find out is the solutions and not necessarily an eating disorder. It could be they've got GI issues is really common. But when we start working on one thing and we come in and say, hey, let's try something here too, whether it's incorporating recovery foods, let's work on a hydration strategy that's not just water. And they notice how much better they feel and they perform. It becomes a game changer. Now you're trained, now you're looking at yourself as a, your body is something that performs for you and you want to excel at your craft as opposed to dieting and weight loss, 
which is what nutrition is usually code for in the dance world. Oh, you, you just tapped into something really, really intriguing for me as uh, actually working with our body and, and, and giving it the best ability to perform on its highest level versus, oh, I can't do this. Like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my body? I grew up with the belief that I have to fight my body, that we're not on the same team. Yeah. You know, you have to take away from your body's needs in order to fit in where that's not the truth. Like when we start asking different questions on how can we actually get on the same team? Like, how can I support you today? Like, what do you need? Sir du Soleil, every single artist going in every single day, they have, they go through a test. 10 questions every day. And depending on how they're answering these questions, they will receive a certain training or their, their training plan for that day is going to be structured depending on where they're at. Like where their body at? Did they sleep okay? Did they rest? Do they have any GI problems? Are they on their period? How are you feeling? Like, did you have intercourse yesterday? Like it's, it is, so important that we are understanding that we're not a machine, that there is so many different, beautiful, complex parts in our body that we can take advantage of and that we need to nurture us. And the more we take care of ourselves, of our body, the more our body will be able to take care of what we want to do. Yeah. And oh. it's so mm -hmm. time that we're understanding that. And I'm, ta I'm talking about the directors here. I'm talking about the people that are in the school and have the responsibility and the privilege to bring in the new generation into this world of artists. Like it's your responsibility to nurture them, not to suppress their ability and kick them out at 25. Just because there is such a big availability because we have a huge demand doesn't mean that you can treat the people that are in your company that have trusted you with their dreams and your their career that you can treat them like they're nothing yeah yeah i think that's true and we hear this quite regular you know regularly it's oh you're replaceable and it's so dehumanizing and it's like oh put your hand in a bucket of water pull it out see how quickly you were replaced and that, and, and these, these are unfortunately control mechanisms, whether they're tactics or not, I don't know, they can be, but these are mechanisms that instill fear and this idea of helplessness. And then that can really set people up for a lot of these disordered eating. So what can I control? I can't control if I'm going to be chosen for the part. My worth is not determined by me. It's always determined by someone else. Am I good enough? I don't decide. They decide all the time. And, and sometimes that, that can be a moving target, which is unfortunate. So there are all these things where we see dancers set up to, to struggle and with food. And quite often it becomes the, I've, I've heard this so many times. It was the only thing I could control in my life. I've heard, I wasn't worried about my body shape it was like, I didn't have body image issues. It was, it was the only thing I could control in my life. And so they start controlling food. It's the, I feel so fill in the blank, worthless, whatever. I need to just be empty because I can't take any more or just like so much stuff. And it's, it's heart, it's heartbreaking. It really is. And so, yes, something you said too, I'm, I'm kind of just, switching, switching lanes here is about the body is not a machine. It's not. That is an analogy that we use it for convenience. Um, we use even the term food as fuel. It is, but it's so much more complicated than that. Your body is so much more complicated than any machine. And there are things about, we, we pretty much know everything about the car that's put together. Like we know everything about it. People can track that stuff down. Your body is going to be different. It's going to be different today, tomorrow, all these circumstances that roll in as you grow and develop and you should grow and develop. That is important. Your body's going to be different from other people's bodies. And, and 
there is no this level of perfection and expectation that you're going to be able to dial in and then follow these regimens is ridiculous. It's it, it, it's working us the wrong direction. It, it creates distrust from the bottom. And the, the biggest problem, I think, from, well, not the biggest, but certainly a large problem is it creates distrust for the dancer about themselves. They can't trust themselves anymore. And if you can't trust yourself, who can you trust? Right. How do you step on a stage and, and yeah. perform at your highest level if you can't trust yourself? Like, where are you going to like, what else are you going to control? Because we, we have that need of certainty in us, right? It's one of our basic human needs. Gosh, when you were talking, something came up, but that is gone. Darn it. Yep. Yeah, and it's true. And I think the idea that, oh, one thing, it's going to be just isolated to food or it's isolated to the classroom. No, we are human beings and all these things are flipped. What's happening here? It, it, will, it will transcend. It'll go into it conceivably can enter every aspect of your life. I don't trust her. I have to, you know, they tell me what to do. Well, Kathleen McGuire Gaines wrote an article, you know, are there some of these ideas of the control and, and does this create dancers who are more susceptible to sexual abuse? Because shut up, put up, I'm going to touch you. You're, you're here, you're replaceable. There are so many things that roll into this and, and how you eat, what you eat, restricting it. I'm not good enough to eat. I don't deserve to eat. You do, you you do all every day. You deserve to eat, like at least three times, maybe five, maybe maybe ten. I don't know. It depends on you. Yeah, and understanding that your body doesn't function the same way and doesn't have the same needs as somebody standing right next to you. Like you cannot mm -hmm. compare their needs with your own needs. Yeah, and that's where knowledge comes in. That's where the support comes in. It is so important. We struggle to ask for help because it has been somewhere down the line ingrained into this industry that, no, you need to know it all by yourself. You got to figure that out. If you show weakness by asking for help, you're nothing. You're never going to make it. Yeah, I and, still and, mm -hmm. struggle with that today, right? Yeah. And you may be, ooh, they're fragile. Ooh, they may be breakable. Right. Oh, we don't want uh, uh, that. Yeah, we don't want to deal with that. Not resilient enough. No reason. Yeah. Mm. yeah right it, it can we quickly go towards that sexual abuse because it is a very interesting theory i i actually can see so when we're looking at the olympic gymnastic team and and what mm. has really in, ex, expired aspired out, mm. out of that whole bubble they've been susceptible and and i listen to sarah klein quite quite often on podcasts and I, I follow her and her story and how she said that she didn't know even that she was abused until she was in her mid-20s until her body from the trauma completely broke down and for 10 years nobody knew what was wrong with her mm -hmm. and only did she understand what happened when she was probed with the question hey have you been sexually abused mm -hmm. And that's when everything unraveled. And the reason why it was possible is because they trusted Larry with everything they had. Mm -hmm. And they would have never assumed any kind of bad, ill intent behind what was going on. And that's where we get blind. And this is where knowing, having language, even though you're in dance, you can still be a communicator. This is why exposing yourself to other areas of human knowledge is so imperative. Yeah. And if that's nutrition and, and, and diet doesn't mean starving yourself, diet just means what kind of foods are you taking in? If that's business knowledge, if that's an other art form, we're not traders for knowing more. It just makes you richer. And uh, it boards mm -hmm. you against, you know, the people that tell you, hey, you need to work for free. That, that you can stand up, actually, no, I don't have to. And here's why. And I'm mm -hmm. not going to. Yeah, I think that is so important. Something that I see quite a bit is, and you're not, is misplaced loyalty. And you are responsible for you. At the end of the day, 
there are going to be people who you trust who simply don't know. And they, and because it's outside their scope of knowledge and understanding, like your teacher may not know, they may not know, have those connections or understand, should you be auditioning for a company? Should you be pursuing a BFA? If you, if you're going to sink that money into the BFA, what are you doing after? If you're, and it is your responsibility to know those things. If you are a parent, it would be really helpful if you guided your child. And if you don't know, it's okay to not know, but it's also, and it's also okay to look for other information to make sure you're making the best choice in your teacher, director, they're, they're one source of information, but maybe you want to check with other people and, and confirm what they say. Or if it, if people give you different information and you think, you know what, I think that's a better path for me. That's okay. And you're not um, betraying anyone by pursuing what's best for you and collecting that kind of knowledge so that you can grow into who you're really supposed to be, not just please someone else because you followed their advice. You're taking responsibility, right? Not blindly following, but leading mm -hmm. your life the way you want it to be and not yeah like buying into the, this, the, the loyalty really struck a chord. Like that was a trigger for me because like, let's look at the Megan Fox story, right? When we look at how these women were asked to be loyal and in return, he was able to do whatever he wanted to do. And he just framed it under the, the, the container of loyalty. We can stretch anything as we want to. And it's the same in, in dance and in arts altogether. We can put anything we want to and make it serve our egos or our own needs. And this is why your knowledge and, and like broaden your knowledge and being your own driver Take agency, take control, stop being the victim, stop thinking that somebody is going to build your career. No, that's that's your responsibility. That's yeah. that's your superpower. You get to do that. That's an honor. Yeah, it really is. And and again, there are so many resources that aren't hard to find these days. You don't have to like have an old telephone book and hope that someone's name is in there. This stuff is readily available. And it is, it's like with the idea of, of agency, if if you know these things, then it, and if your, if your director, teacher, whatever, is not providing this information for you of, hey, here are resources, you need to find them. You need to have a team that can help, if, if dance is going to be ca your career, that can help you pave the path you want to go. Is it, you know, someone who can, do you need to help with your resume and your audition strategies? Do you need an accountant? Do you need to learn how to manage your money? I have students who come to me or dancers. Oftentimes they are students because they don't know how to, they don't know how to feed themselves at all. They didn't have time to do it when they were in their growing up and mom did all the things and ran them around. Then they get to college and they don't know what to do because they never have that information or that education, you can find that stuff. You don't have to wait. If, if your director puts out things like they want to do weigh-ins and they want to, you know, or here's a diet we want you to follow and everyone's going to do like this. And we're kind of doing the team diet kind of thing. You don't have to subscribe to that. Like that's, you really need to have agency there. And you need to be able to look and say, is this, is the information I'm getting, are they a credible source for this information? And there are ways you can say that. So if it's, if it's about a plie, I would expect they're a credible source of information. If it's about your career, maybe or maybe not. Maybe they haven't been that person. There's so many things. It seems like to now in any, you know, in so many things, creating that career pathway, they may not have all those tools. They probably don't. They may have some suggestions. You may need to have someone else, a coach or a, another provider, help you or guide you along. They aren't going to have all the answers about physical therapy. If you have an injury, they aren't going to be able to diagnose it. That, that's not their job. They may have some ideas of what they've seen before, but really your job is to get to your physical therapist, your athletic trainer, your physician. If you have concerns about diet and nutrition, it's, you need to have your own dietitian. And this yeah. is why it is so imperative that you are getting paid for what you're doing because if you're not having any money, how are you going to reinvest in yourself? No business, like your business would not be functioning if you wouldn't be taking money in exchange for your services and reinvest it in your business or hire coaches that will help you to evolve 
or higher help that will do the things that are just not in your superpower. This is how business works. And this is exactly how you as your own business can work if you apply one principle and that is being or feeling worthy of actually earning money. That is not dirty, that you haven't spent the last five, six, 10 years learning how to be a dancer and then not being paid for it. Actually, some companies have the audacity to put in an apprentice program where dancers have to pay for it. Yeah. So no, that that's not yeah. cool. No. Not cool at all. No. no. So no. Whew. yeah, and, and and just you know, just a final thought on that. If you're concerned about the amount, a lot of things are expensive, but if you look at the it, some of these things are investments, like getting a a career coach who's specific or business coach specific to the dance world, if they can help guide your way or reveal information to you that you didn't know, you may end up saving a lot of time and heartache and money. Because if your plan was to pursue one thing or go to a particular area that wasn't really going, you thought, I don't know, like going to college and getting a BFA was going to get you where you needed to go. And someone says, have you considered these other pathways or do you know the, the real cost of that education? And do you have a plan to make that money back? Right. Um, and, and if you're like, and if you do, that's great. And if you don't, they say, well, here's some ways that that may happen. Or have you considered these alternatives instead? They, maybe you haven't because you've been busy going to school, you know, dancing, rehearsing, and all those things. And those people with that expertise can be very, very helpful and save you a lot of resources. Yes. And something that just dropped in was that, you know, in, in dance particularly, everything we do is calculated. Like there's physics in place, like our own body, all of these things. Like before you step into an arabesque, you go through like a checklist, you understand how far you have to step out and the coordination of your arms and your leg and what your toes do. Yeah. Why are we not applying that further out into, into your, your life? Like it's the same principle. Every, every action or every reaction, every step you take will have a, a consequence. Mm -hmm. Life. And, and for some reason, artists never think about that, not understanding that, hey, if I don't get paid for two years in a row, that will actually then come into, like, I won't have anything at 20, and I don't know what company, and I cannot ask my parents to. Like, it's, it's just think before you do, before you say yes. Think about the whole consequences of that action that you're taking. Yeah. And what you're saying no to. Yeah. No well. sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I could talk to you forever. I may just hop on a boat and come over. <laughs> I know we can do that. Yeah. yeah. Last question for you. Uh, actually, I have two. Well, so I, I'm aware of that you're coming out with a membership program. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about that for a little bit and what that entails and yeah, so I've, I've decided to do a membership program because I've had requests one and it, and in some parts it goes to those college students who just simply don't know what to do. They need some fundamentals. So these BFA kids and how to manage pursuing a BFA is, comes with a lot of challenges other college students don't have. So in part, it's that in part, it's from moms who've asked me, you know, they just, what are some of the fundamentals to get their dancers started on the right foot so that they're eating well and we can hopefully detour a lot of these disordered eating things by having information available, quality information from a credible source to help with food, nutrition, eating, because they're all related, but they're not the same thing. And to help dancers with that, not everyone needs or wants a one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian. And so a membership program makes it a little bit easier. It's more affordable. It's more approachable. So that's, those are kind of the background points. So anyway, so I will be coming out with a, a, a membership program later this year. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't set a target date yet. I've got another, a few other projects that I'm having sewing up before I launch that, but it will, the intention is to provide nutrition information specific to dancers and answer the questions that they often come to me 
to me with or that I recognize they need help with. So including things like snacks, how to eat, like literally the how to eat, how to, what, what happens when you're stressed out about meal times? If you're struggling with bloat, are there things that you may be doing or eating that could be causing that, that you could make some shifts? Dispelling common diet myths and trends, like things we see on, on TikTok trends and are they good? Are they bad? Do they have any merit? Recovery foods, things that are important to help you support your body and your growth and development. So you can dance as long as you as you want to, and you're not limited by things that could, you could have easily, you know, food, nutrition are really easy ways to enhance your performance and your career. And it doesn't have to be complicated. So that's the point of it is really to make things simple and approachable for dancers. Unity, no. Right. Like I find membership programs always very convenient because they also come with like people that are in there that I can talk to and connect to and, and yeah. actually see, oh, I'm not the only one struggling. Or yeah, right. Absolutely. That idea of having a um, kind of support and other people to hear from. So like what I call office hours, you know, if we have a, a live event or time where you can come in and just ask your questions can be really helpful and to have that access to a dietitian who specializes in, in dance. So whether it's a dancer or their parent or even dance instructors who just want to be better equipped and have a better understanding of the field, that can be, that that's the aim. So yeah, it'll probably, I'm looking at starting something most likely June, could be September. It'll either be, it'll either be start a summer or start a school. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for that. Now, where can we find you? Where are you most active on social media? Instagram for sure. And that is my handle is my name at, so it's at K R I S T I N underscore K O S K I N E N underscore R D N. So that's where you can find me most often. You can also find me on my website, which is www.eatwellpros.com, E A T W E L L P R O S dot com. And yeah, those are my, that's where I hang out the most. Love your dog. <laughs> Is it, can you hear him snoring in the background? I can. My dog was just let out because she was snoring. So oh my gosh, I tried to use the microphone to like minimize that stuff. It's all good. This is what it is like. Okay, last question. Imagine your 16 year old self would sit down and listen to you, giving her a piece of advice that could, you know, not prevent heartache, but like steer her in a direction that you, for some reason, had to go through the hard way. Like what, what would you tell her? All right. I would, I would probably tell her you have so much more going for you than you realize. You are being distracted by things that don't matter. And if you, if I can give you the objective things, and I would tell myself those specific objective things that reflect that, you need to lean into that because that's the truth. And these distractions you're entertaining are taking you off track. Oh, thank you. That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah I tell her the same thing. Yeah. Don't put your energy where it's not producing more energy. Thank you so much for this conversation oh, yet again, like an hour, 13 minutes. You know what, guys? Great value here. So if there is whatever resonated with you, what are your mic drop moments? We would love to hear that. Share it on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, send us smoke signals. You can also tell us, you know, what you're not agreeing with and what you don't want to talk about anymore. That for us is the most important thing because we're here to serve you and to offer you value. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I could talk to you for hours. Thank you so much, darling. Thank you. Right back at you. Thank you so much for listening. If this message resonates with you, please pass it on to someone who needs to hear this right now. And if you like what you've heard, your feedback will go a very long way. If you just take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review, that would mean the world to me. Till next time, point at yourself to rise to all that you are capable of.